my name is John Sturdivant. I'm the director of RET product development at Mentor Graphics Corporation, uh, where I've worked for the last uh, 10 years. So at Mentor Graphics, we have to support uh, our customer base from everything from in the design community to in the manufacturing community. And we have to place our bets along multiple paths because it's not completely clear uh, the one path that will emerge. And in fact, I think there'll be more than one path that emerges. So for many, many years, for instance, we've been investing in EUV technology, making sure that we have the data preparation solutions when that finally goes into manufacturing. And as you know, that's taken quite a while. Um, but even if it doesn't work for some reason, um, other things like multiple patterning or DSA, uh, E-beam direct right, we invest in all of those technologies um, to make sure that we've got solutions ready in time. We're supporting right now the 20 nanometer node, there's a 14 nanometer node under early development, 10 nanometer node is on its way, a 7 nanometer node. Uh, it's interesting that the critical dimensions for these things keep shrinking and shrinking, and the time between the nodes keeps shrinking and shrinking, so the pace is, is uh, uh, just unending. Uh, the challenges as we go to these nodes are about four different axes worth. Um, process challenges, uh, just keeping up with what is the new exposure wavelength, whether it's EUV. Uh, materials challenges, there's things like directed self-assembly, which are an entirely new paradigm for imaging and patterning. Um, and that has lots of consequences in terms of how do we model the behavior of these very interesting copolymers that tend to self-assemble and aggregate in, in uh, fascinating ways as long as you can coax them appropriately. DSA has been gaining momentum every year for the last three or four years and SPY is a good place to come and kind of hear what is the, and sort of benchmark the status of these things. I'd say directed self-assembly has gone from a uh, scientific curiosity relatively few years ago to an early research project, and it's now really more in the early development phases where things like defectivity are being driven down, practical f flows in the fab are being demonstrated, data preparation flows, we're working on models that can generate the guiding patterns. So right now I would have to say the directed self-assembly is uh, the hot topic that's emerging. From our perspective, we focus on the interaction of the process in manufacturing with the design and DSA, uh, which will be used initially for contact and via layers, and then eventually for line space poly metal, relies upon a design restrictions for regular gridded layouts. And we've been headed in that direction for optical lithography for many years. Uh, so the industry has slowly and reluctantly moved in that direction. Um, but it's going to be even more disruptive to fully adopt DSA in manufacturing, and that's probably the biggest challenge that we face. Optical proximity correction, OPC, started uh, about 15 years ago uh, at the 130 nanometer node. It's interesting because it started out as optical proximity correction. It's grown to include a lot of other factors besides optical, so uh, PPC or process proximity correction is probably a better term. Each year it expands in terms of the number of process phenomena that we're trying to model. Um, it's been really vital to success of semiconductor manufacturing ever since about 90 nanometers. It used to be sort of a luxury or an option, uh, but starting at about 90 nanometers you would not have a fab uh, unless you had OPC. There are disruptive technologies like uh, imprint where you don't need uh, projection uh, limited optics or diffraction limited projection optics, but you're still going to need to build templates. So even like in DSA, where there's no uh, true photoresist, there's no exposure by light, but you have to build the templates, and those are at the critical dimensions. So building those templates is always going to require OPC. In the case of DSA, it's fascinating because you have to build the guiding patterns for the directed self-assembly, and that in itself is going to require extreme computational uh, efforts. And one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that you partition for OPC accuracy all the sources of errors. And the more you look into those sources of errors, the more that you find there's a quarter of a nanometer here and a quarter of a nanometer there. Um, so we built a case that uh, each one of those things has to be accounted for and we had a Pareto to say here's the most important right on down the list. Uh, and the good news is that uh, whether it's in the mask industry, whether it's in the scanner uh, hardware industry, uh, whether it's in our area of actually coming up with the computational algorithms, uh, all those pieces work together to keep us going down and down and down. It's staggering to me the improvements we've made in, over the years in accuracy of the models, um, but I'm equally impressed by in the hardware world, the way that the overlay budgets have been shrunk. The audience hears overlay budgets of two or three nanometers and they're maybe ho-hum, but 
I'm not sure that people stop and think about what that really means if you've ever seen a scanner uh, and how complex it is to be able to maintain those mechanical stages to two or three nanometers is really staggering. I'd say above all though that the challenge is how to do this in a cost-effective manner. Uh, this industry has been fueled by an ever, ever decreasing in cost per function and as long as we can keep doing that there will be more and more challenges and at meetings like SPY uh, is when the industry comes together and just when you're getting depressed that we're running out of gas and, and we're running out of solutions, uh, you hear about all the things going around worldwide and you're re-energized that no, no, this is going to keep going for uh, several more years. I really think that each generation there's there's really no limit to the ingenuity of engineers and teams working together. Um, I'd say that the difference though is that cost equation, right? So we're always going to be able to come up with new technical solutions, but will they be cost effective? That'll eventually run out of gas and, and will plateau out uh, in this industry, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon.